If you did research as an undergraduate, especially social sciences research, you may be entitled to financial compensation. No, I'm just kidding. You're not gonna get money for doing work as an undergraduate. Though a benefit that you will get that others don't is that you'll probably understand the research methods questions that the MCAT asks on the psych soc section. Or if you like me, you may have also had to do a research literacy class that taught you this stuff. The truth is the research methods questions on the MCAT are easy. They test predictable characteristics about research and you can't afford to miss those types of questions if you wanna score well on the MCAT. I'm going to show you the four ways that research methods are commonly tested on the MCAT and how you can never miss a question on them again. The first way that research methods are tested is through study structure. Is this a case study? Is it experimental? Is it observational, self-report, longitudinal, cross-sectional? You need to know what all of those words mean as far as the study structure goes, but also what it means for the study's validity. An experimental study where we're able to manipulate the independent variable, keep all the other variables the same, and see how the outcome changes um, in the dependent variable. It's a very strong study structure, and it's the only one that can actually de determine causation over correlation or some other type of statistical relationship. But for most social science research, we can't really do experimental setups. It's either impossible or just unethical to do so. We can't put people who have panic disorder on a treadmill to get their heart rate up and see if they have a panic attack. It's an experimental design, but it's unethical to try and give people a panic attack. Observational studies are more common, but you can't determine any kind of causal relationship from them. There's just too many other factors that could be leading into it that we do not control just because we are observing how things present themselves to us in nature. Long story short, know your study types and what it means for the study's validity. The second way, and what I would argue is the most common way that research methods are tested on the MCAT, is through limitations. A limitation is kind of like a stinky part of a research design that's usually unavoidable. There's many types of limitations, but the ones that I've seen tested on the MCAT include small sampling size, uh, some kind of sampling bias, exclusion, confounding variables, and self-report. Again, these are usually unavoidable. How else are you going to determine someone's level of depression than to just survey them. Of course, that introduces that self-report bias because they may try to present themselves as better or worse than they actually are, um, and it's quite subjective, but it really is like the only way to do it. So for these types of questions, be able to pick out what a study's limitation is. If there's a limitation that's mentioned in the passage, they will likely ask a question asking you to basically just say what the limitation was. For example, this. Here's another noteworthy example. And another limitation question. I got these all from the sample test. So you see how important these uh, research methods questions are? Limitation is a common way for them to ask about them. Another aspect of research methods that is commonly tested is correlation versus causation. So not only is it important to know how a correlational relationship works, um, what a positive and negative correlation looks like, but also when the MCAT is trying to sneak a causal relationship into a correlational design. Take this standalone question as an example. Remember how I said that an experimental design is the only way to assess a causal relationship? Well, this is not an experimental design. We're asking participants to self-report how often they engage in altruistic behavior. There's so many variables that could confound this type of research. What if the younger generation is more apt to lie and therefore they report more altruistic behaviors, even if they don't do them? Also, the way B is worded, it makes it sound like our age controls our altruistic behaviors. What if it's actually a generational thing and, and people born in, I, I don't know, the 90s are just more altruistic throughout their lives than boomers? <laughs> Regardless of the possible confounding variables, 
This is not an experimental setup and it cannot determine that age causes any sort of level of altruism at all. Red flags should go off in your head when you see the word cause on the MCAT and you better have really, really solid passage evidence that this was an experimental design and that it does prove causation. And the last way they test research methods is honestly a miscellaneous pile and it's just a cop out for me. But I just wanted to make sure that I kind of told you guys about these words so that you're not surprised if you see them on the MCAT and you kind of are prepared and have a flashcard for them or whatever you need to do so that you know what these things are. So what it means to be able to control for variables that's occasionally tested on the MCAT. Um, so know what that is, what it means, and if it's good or bad for the study. Being able to pick out confounding variables like I just did for the altruism question. And significance. So know what p-value is, uh, what error bars mean, and what a statistically significant result means for the study. You may even see some of these statistically significant kind of questions in the BB or the CP sections. So make sure that you know uh, what that means and how to interpret that from a graph. Usually it's like asterisks or error bars on a graph. If you guys took anything away from this video, please hit like and subscribe or leave a comment telling us ways that research methods trip you up. We can always make another video on this. All right guys, till next time.